I love Linux, and I don't think that that is a secret for anyone. I mean, if it is a secret, then you should take a look at the channel name. Linux is right there in the title. I adore so many things about Linux, it's not even funny. The community and the freedom and the ability to try new things and learn new things, it's all amazing. There are so many things about Linux that I just enjoy, and there's a good reason why I use it as my daily driver. I prefer it over every other operating system I've ever tried, and it has enabled me to meet new people, to learn new things. It's just, Linux is fantastic, and I don't think if you're watching this video you disagree with that statement. But, all that being said, there are some things about Linux and open source software in particular that I really don't care for, and I would go so far as to say that I hate these things. So. What I'm going to do is talk about five things that I hate about Linux. Now, some of them are specifically about Linux. Some of them are more about applications that are on Linux. So, to be honest with you, I kind of had to reach for five of them. So, some of them are kind of superfluous. So, let's go ahead and jump in. The first one, I'm going to have a hard time finding anyone, I think, to disagree with this. But, tray icons need to disappear. Now, I don't agree with the GNOME Foundation on pretty much anything. To be honest with you, I don't like GNOME all that much. I, do, I just like it less than I used to now that I've used it more often, but it's still never going to be my desktop of choice, and a lot of the decisions the developers make just make no sense to me. But one of the decisions that they made a couple years ago to get rid of tray icons is a decision I think is actually the right one. Unfortunately, tray icons aren't actually going to weigh, so by taking them out of GNOME, they've made it harder for people to use them. And because they're not going away, people have to use them. So you're probably wondering, Matt, what are you talking about? So if I actually just change to my desktop here, you'll see these icons up here. These are tray icons. And unfortunately, you have to have them. So if you use certain applications, the only way to access them when they're not in focus is through a tray icon. So the one that is specifically for me, the one reason why I had to turn on the tray in Polybar is pCloud. pCloud has no other way to open up their preferences other than right clicking on the icon up here and going to preferences. So that meant I had to enable the tray, which is something that I hardly ever do because I hate it. Like it ruins the aesthetic of my rice and everyone knows how much I care about what my operating system looks like. I spend a lot of time making sure that the look and feel of my distro is amazing and I have to mar it with these dumb ass icons. It drives me absolutely bonkers. Like seriously, they need to go away. Now, like I said, that's not Linux specific. Really, that's on every operating system. They just need to go away. Just let me open up the application, like whatever. I don't understand why we're still in the age where this thing needs to exist. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So those things need to go away. I hate them with a passion. That's actually the reason why I'm making this video because I needed to rant about those for a little while and I didn't think I could make a whole video just about tray icons and have anybody actually want to watch it. So moving on to number two. The second one is one I don't know if, the, if anybody's actually ever noticed before, but when you install Linux, and this doesn't matter what distribution you're on, when you install Linux and you open up the installer, Usually this is in GUI installers. I've never really noticed this in a text-based installer like Arch Linux. But when you're using a GUI installer and it pops up, especially when you're using Calamari's, but it does it with other installers as well, there's a period of time where it is scanning your hard drives. Like, it feels like it's scanning every single file on every single hard drive you have installed on your computer. And that means that it sometimes takes many, many minutes before you actually get started on the installer or before you can proceed with the installation. So, for example, with the Calamari's one, you can't actually start the installer, like the install process, until it's scanned your entire system. It'll say process running at the beginning and you'll have a spinning circle or something. And what it's doing is scanning every hard drive so that it knows what hard drives are attached to your computer. But the problem is, is I have, well, let's see, I have four hard, no, f no, I have six hard drives in my computer actually inside of it, and I have two external hard drives. So I have a ton of hard drives attached to my computer, and when I install Linux, I have to have the installer scan every single one of those things. Now, it's not a big deal if I just had to see what thing, what 
hard drives are available, but it feels like it has to ins to scan all the files on those hard drives, like it's looking for other distros or something, which is probably what it's actually doing. That's the Calamari's one. Ubuntu does it as well, so when you click past the one setting where it asks you if you want a minimal install or whatever, and you're moving on to the partition part of the installer, the pause between that one screen and the next can run up to 20 minutes for me. The same as it is with the Calamari's, sometimes that can take up to a half an hour before I can even start installing. Uh, Fedora does it as well. So when I reinstalled Fedora and moved to the KDE spin this last week, the part where you have to select the drive that you want to install Fedora on wouldn't actually let me get into there until it scanned the entire hard drive system on my computer. So it had to go through all of them. And that took like almost 45 minutes. Like it was horrendous. It's gotten to the point now where I've considered just unplugging every hard drive except for the one I want to install Linux on so that I can just install Linux and then replug everything back in because then I don't have to go through that 45 minutes of hell of trying to get that thing just to move on. Like don't like seriously you don't have to scan the entire hard drive. It's not that hard. Like seriously LSBLK exists for a reason and it doesn't take that long to run LSBLK. I'm sure there's more technological stuff that's going on there but I don't think that it's really necessary. Or at least you know what make it optional. Like just let me tell you where I want to install the drive. Just list out the drives. I'm installing on that one. That's the only one you have to install. Or the only one you have to, to scan. So the next one on the list is one that I actually like. So the application that I want to bitch about for a minute is Samba. Now, the thing is, is that I don't know of anyone who has ever had Samba work for them all the time. So every once in a while, you'll probably have a good experience with Samba because Samba is actually a very good technology. But if you, if you don't know what Samba is, basically it's a application that allows you to set up folders on one computer and share them with everything else that's on your network. It's a great little tool. And the process for setting it up is actually not that hard. The problem is, is that it doesn't always work. And the other problem is that it, it doesn't always work a lot. Like, seriously, I've spent so much time trying to get Samba to work between this computer and the computer that sits behind me. Like, a lot of time. And it's, most of the time, it just never works at all. Like, I get it set up properly on this computer, which is where all of my stuff resides. And I want to set it up on that computer so that I can access to this stuff, right? Most of the time, that computer can never see the folders that I shared. And I've set up Samba properly. Like, I know how to set Samba up. And even when I say, well, maybe I'm just being an idiot and I don't know what I'm actually doing, I go look at the instructions for how to set up Samba. I follow those instructions and I still can't get it to work. Uh, sometimes it does work. Like, randomly, it will work just fine. And it becomes even more of a problem when you're trying to share files and directories between two different operating systems or two different distros. That makes it even harder for Samba to actually work fine. So while I wouldn't say I hate Samba, I do hate the fact that Samba is not easier to use. So the next one on the list is lack of support for third-party peripherals. And this one doesn't actually apply to me that much, but I have two things that I use that don't have great support. So I have a Focusrite Scarlet Solo. I think that's the name of it. It's a Scarlet Solo. I don't know what the brand name is. It's an audio interface, right? It's what I plug my microphone into. And it works fine on Linux, but the problem is that there's no driver support on Linux. So you can't ever update that thing. You have to install Windows in order to update it. And I'm never going to install Windows, so it's just going to sit in this firmware forever and ever. I'm never going to get to update it. Which means that... When things break, I'm not going to be able to fix it, probably. Which means probably I'm just going to have to buy a new one because there's some issues on there where, like, it won't actually send phantom power to a microphone. Like, now, now this Heil PR40 doesn't actually need it, but I have one microphone that does, and I can't use it because the 48 power, uh, 48 volt phantom power doesn't actually work on that audio interface. Uh, another one is the trackball mouse that I use. It has extra buttons. And while I have found places where I can actually map those buttons to certain things, I don't have access to the software that will actually give me full-on support for the things that I'd like to program these, those buttons for. So the lack of support for third-party peripherals is not a good thing. And I hate that 
Linux is so unpopular, I guess, that these developers just haven't taken the time to port their stuff over to Linux. The biggest problem, of course, for a lot of people is going to be RGB and like AIO cooler support and fan curve software and all this stuff that is very well supported on Windows, but has no support on Linux. Now, the community has gotten together for a lot of this stuff and created workarounds, but it's never all that great, unfortunately. It's definitely hacky, right? Because they have to reverse engineer a lot of stuff, and it's just hit or miss. So one of the companies that is famous for never supporting Linux is Elgato, and a lot of their stuff is just really good, like really good hardware, but it just does not work with Linux all that well, and even though people have tried to make software to work with it, it's still kind of hacky. Now, the last one on the list is a thing that I have complained about on Linux for quite a while. Now, as I talked about earlier, I have a ton of drives installed on my computer. Some of them inside, some of them ex external. A few of them are still NTFS. They're NTFS because they were originally drives that I used on Windows. They were originally formatted when I was using Windows, and moving stuff off from there, reformatting them to a more Linux friendly format, and then putting all the stuff back on is just kind of beyond me at the moment. I just don't have, it would be some hard drive musical chairs in order to do that. And it would just kind of be a pain in the butt. NTFS support on Linux has gotten better over the last couple of years. That's for sure. They have worked on making NTFS support in the kernel a lot better. However, it's still not that great. And while it does work, it is also very processor or at least resource intensive. So if I take you over to HTOP, one of the things that you're going to see, if we can find it, is actually NTFS. Yeah, you can see this part right here. Now it's not actually taking up any resources right now, but it will spike when you use the hard drive, of course. Now that's not a big deal. Of course, pro resources are going to be assigned to a hard drive when you're using it. The problem is, is that when you've done using it, a lot of times that those resources remain taken by NTFS for some reason. Like at least on this computer, even though at points where I'm not actually using that particular hard drive, NTFS still takes up some resources. Now it's not that big of a deal for me because I have a ton of resources, but I can see that if you're on like a laptop or something that is very limited in terms of CPU and RAM usage that that even that little bit of NTFS stuff that is always kind of like running in the background is kind of a pain in the butt and it could be kind of worrying. The thing that bothers me is that it exists in the first place. Like why does the NTFS the demon or whatever happens to be have to run all the time, even though a lot of times I don't even have those hard drives mounted. It's really, really weird. And it's not something that I, I mean, it's not that big of a deal, but it's again, every time I'm, Every time I open up HTOP and I see NTFS there, even though I'm not using that hard drive at the moment, you know, I'm like, why is that there? Like, why is it running? NTFS support is also, like, you can read and use your NTFS drive, but the permissions on NTFS are broken on Linux. I don't know if anybody knows this, or maybe I'm just doing something wrong, but the NTFS drives on Linux, when you mount them, have wide open permissions and you can't change those permissions like they are read write and execute for everyone and that is not that's not great right you can't change that and that's the reason why it would be great for me to put all that stuff on a different hard drive where i can change to a different type of hard drive system like an ext4 or butterfs or whatever it would happen to be right but doing that is still kind of hard it's like it's really hard when you have like three or four terabytes on a drive and you can't really transfer that to another drive really easily and then format that drive the, the drive that's ntfs then transfer everything back it's not as easy as it would seem to be with someone who has as many hard drives as i have so those are the things that i hate about linux now i say hate right like Mostly I've just used the word hate in this video because I'm going to use that as the title just because I want to, you know, be a YouTuber, but I don't actually hate anything outside of the tray icons. Like for the most part, the rest of the stuff is, it's okay. Like I put up with Samba because 
I'm always struggling with Samba, and I think everybody who uses Samba struggles with Samba at one point or another. That, that's just the nature of using Samba. The peripherals thing, that's just the nature of using Linux because Linux isn't as popular as Windows. Therefore, developers aren't going to take time to make software for Linux. It's just the nature of the beast, right? I hate that it's true, but what you going to do, right? That kind of rhymed. The installer thing where it takes so much time to actually proceed with the installation drives me bonkers, but I'm used to it at this point. And like I said, it, some sometimes when I install Linux on a hard drive, I just unplug the external hard drives that I have. Those are the big ones, and that saves some time. So that's, you know, it's it's a workaround. I wish it didn't have to do that. So, like, I don't, I mean, hate, it doesn't keep me from installing, so I've just gotten used to it. The NTFS support one is just something that kind of bothers my brain. Like, I don't know why it has to work like that. Like, so... I don't know why that NTFS thing bugs me, but it does. So, uh, what, what can you do? Anyway, so that is it for this video. In the comment section below, if there's anything that you hate about Linux, I'd love to hear about it. If uh, you think I'm off base on any of this stuff, you can also leave those in the comment section below. I'd, I'd love to hear about it. If you want to, you can follow me on Twitter, at the LinuxCast. Thanks everybody who has followed me on Twitter over the last few months. I'm over 1,200 followers now, which is just... I've never been this popular on social media. It's a lot of pressure, but... um. Yeah, it's kind of fun also because I, I bitch a lot about stuff on Twitter. That's really where I go to bitch about stuff because there are a lot of things that I like to rant about that I don't make videos about. So if you want to find out some of this stuff, go follow me on Twitter. It's kind of fun. You can also follow me on Mastodon and Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. I don't spend a lot of time on Mastodon. I should spend more time there. I should definitely do that. Anyways, those links will be in the video description. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Linux cast, just like all of these fine people. I still haven't fixed that damn graphic. The only time I remember to do that is when I actually do this. So, But anyways, it doesn't matter. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. I truly do, honest to God, appreciate it so very much, and I never find the words to say anything but thank you. So thank you so very much. Thanks to everybody for watching. See you next time.